Hey everybody, so today we're going to be discussing Chapter 42, Ambulance Operations and Air Medical Response. In this chapter we'll be discussing the culture of safety within EMS, crew resource management, driving an ambulance, warning devices, uh, roadway incident safety, phases of a call, air medical transport, as well as security and safety. When you, as us as EMS providers, when we are working in, in an ambulance, that truck is, should be a place of comfort and support for our patients. From the time that they call us, well they, if, no matter what it is, to them it is a life-threatening condition and, and that's why they decided to call 911. Uh, so they expect for them to get the proper uh, medical care that they need. All, from the time that, that we arrive all the way through to the uh, arrival at the hospital. And it's not just the care that they get in the back. Whoever is operating that apparatus and driving the ambulance to the back to the hospital should be operating it in a skillful manner and always being aware of everything that is around them. So that way they don't uh, get into an accident and harm either the person in the back or the uh, general public. Within this chapter we'll also de uh, describe the elements of how we can create a culture of safety with an EMS, crew resource management, and how to operate an ambulance with safety with this safety in mind. Reporting errors must be valued as crucial with in improving safety. When risks are identified, the EMS system and personnel must strive to correct the risks to prevent or reduce the chances of the same errors occurring again. Individuals are not blamed for the error due to the understanding that human error is a facet of emergency practice that will never be truly worked out. However, it is encouraged for individuals to identify their own errors so that way they, that they may have caused or created unintentionally so that way it can be identified and remediated appropriately. So that way it doesn't happen again. By using cre crew resource management appropriately, no matter if you are uh, the EMS leadership team or a team member, it helps minimizing errors. By improving safety within the EMS crew the pa for the patient and the general public. It also assists in improving the team's performance and increasing situational awareness. And it ensures that all crew members have equal value and input into a situation. And it starts with just an opening or attention getter. Bob, huh? What? You know, that's your opening or attention getter. Something to get their attention. And then you state your concern with the situation based on your analysis. The patient is uh, complaining of lower back of back pain um, after falling 20 feet out of a tree. You know, I'm I'm concerned that he may have a back uh, problem or possibly have a spinal injury. Should we put a spinal package to the patient? All right. So in that, we I've stated my concern, I've stated the problem, and I've stated my solution. All that's left now is for Bob to agree or disagree to it. Yes, based off of your of uh, your assessment, yes, we should spinal package this patient. Okay. At no time was the, were they was the person belittled. Everything was done in a tactful way. There's five factors of crew resource management that is essential. The first one being communication. Communication is key to eliminating mistakes that could ha uh, could potentially occur due to misunderstandings by communicating with in closed loop communication. I tell I say something and it's just yes or no. Okay? Um and ensuring and try to reduce the potential for erroneous information or the information given to be misinterpreted. If there is any potential for misinterpretation, we need to ensure that we clarify our message so that way errors we reduce the chances of a potential error from occurring. We're aware of the situation. 
from the time that we get uh get out of the of uh, out of the station to the time that we pull in after the call you should always be aware of everything that is going on and not res obtain uh, tunnel vision focusing just on what's occurring with the patient otherwise you might miss something that's going on in the background the scenes that we work on the scenes that we deal with are old are always changing it's a dynamic situation there should also be decision making going on we make decisions based on a wide variety of information and sources such as dispatch stuff that we might find on scene or through our assessment to what the patient might be telling us to what family might be telling us and we need to be able to based off that information being aware of what's needed what's pertinent to what we're going on so that way we don't overload ourselves and ultimately cause go with a wrong decision although the team leader is the final authority in making this decision the leader has to rely on both valuing the input from all members of the crew and based off of their own uh, experience excuse me there should also be teamwork there's the whoever's the senior person the senior medic senior EMT they're the leader and then you have the team members each member on that team has to understand their role and ha have a mutual respect for all members for example on a let's say you're running a two-man ambulance crew okay it's me and a basic partner we arrive on scene you know my partner knows all right once we arrive on scene we're both gonna uh i'm gonna grab the monitor and the jump bag i'm gonna go grab the stretcher okay because on the way we have our truck situated the ambulance and jump bag is at the uh side door excuse me so that way I can grab that stuff and go straight inside. Once we get inside, you know, while I'm assessing the patient, asking them questions, my partner's getting vital signs. Um, if we're working a code, if it's just the two of us, my partner is knocking out chest compressions while I'm getting the monitor on. We manage our team appropriately to ensure that care is being provided. And we also keep an eye for any barriers that could potentially inhibit communication, um, the situational awareness, any decision making, or the camaraderie of the team. By not being able to identify these barriers, whether it's a physical uh, limitation, um, an emotional situation, a stressful scene, it inhibits the effective decision making and communication of the team, which could likely then lead to team failure and a possible injury to the, either the patient or other EMS personnel. To be an effective team member, you should be able to communicate accurately while listening and accepting feedback. You should also be able to demonstrate followership but receptive to leadership. You should be confident and compassionate and mature in the skills that you are providing. Any tasks that you are assigned by the team leader, you should be reporting back on. So if you're getting a blood pressure I saw the the team leader says hey give me a blood pressure on this patient you say okay I'm getting a blood pressure blood pressure is this 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 advocate for any safety concerns and be always safety conscious if you see something that doesn't that's your guts telling you something's wrong say it you should be tactful in your uh, when talking to all team members no matter if it's the leader or someone else because you should treat all team members as equals and with an equal level of respect regardless of their rank their title or their experience most states gives you the privilege with proper precautions to do the following while driving the ambulance to an emergency such as exceeding the speed limit posted only if you are not endangering lives or property 
Usually, most cities and ordinances only allow us to drive 10 miles an hour over the speed limit um, or five on a major roadway or five miles over the speed limit while operating within on uh sorry i was a student had emailed me um only five miles an hour over the speed limit in a rural or commercial area we're also allowed to drive the wrong way down a one-way street or drive down the opposite side of the road pending it is safe to do so If needed, we can proceed. We're also permitted to proceed through a red light or red flashing signal and pass other vehicles in no passing zones, pending we have cleared the way to ensure that we can get through safely. In order to operate an uh, ambulance, you must first off you must have a valid driver's license. If you are unable to maintain a valid driver's license, you will not be able to operate that apparatus. Um, we must be all responding to an emergency if we're using our warning devices. Uh, if we are coming up on a red light, we can cautiously move through it, but we have to slow down while entering the intersection so that all traffic can stop to allow you to pass. We are only requesting the right of way. We're not guaranteed to have the right of way. We can also park our ambulance anywhere to ensure care for the patient, but ensuring that we're not parking it just over the crest of a hill on a busy highway without posting flares or getting a police officer to divert traffic out of your lane so that way we can ensure good roadway safety practices. Um, if we do, uh, if something does occur, um, if it is found that we did not exercise due regard for the safety of others, we are liable for the co potential consequences that arise. When driving an ambulance to ensure that the call is properly safe, obviously everybody within that apparatus should be wearing a seatbelt, definitely if you're in the front. Um, Sometimes we'll have family members ride up, ride with us. They should be wearing their seat belts as well. If you are operating that apparatus, you should be holding the steering wheel with both hands to ensure that you have proper control of the ambulance. When you are going through your EVOC course, um, or when you get first get hired on, when you are going to be going through practicing, you should be driving the vehicle that you will be operating uh, when you enter the field. You should, if you're going to be driving an ambulance, when you're doing EVOC or you're learning the roadways or practicing driving around, you shouldn't be driving your personal vehicle or a command vehicle that would be like a sedan or an SUV. It does not operate the same. You should also be in, keep in mind of uh, the potential weather and road conditions that you are uh, going to be driving in whether it is a bright sunny day where the roads are dry or if the roads are wet, um, icy, if it's windy outside, you should always be able to be aware of it and ensure that you respond to it appropriately. You should also, when you're driving, ensuring that you are selecting the best route for travel, ensuring that it is one that is safe. There's not a lot of bumps or areas where you could potentially get into an accident. But ensuring that you're going in a in a in a route that is effective time-wise, um, you know, if you know if you have a choice between route A or route B, and route B is you know an extra 15, 20 minutes and an extra eight miles, and option B is going straight downtown and it cuts you know half of the response time, you know that might be your general route. However, there may be an accident or there may be something going on in Route B that causes you to have to go a separate way. <coughs> Excuse me. You should always have your headlights on. This ensures that uh, you are always being able to be seen. When we are driving, and we're definitely when we're driving emergency traffic, 
we should always have all of our lights on with the exception of our uh, floodlights to ensure that every that we can be seen appropriately and that we can see everything that is on the roadway when using warning devices you should use ex uh, exercise extreme caution when using them uh, because it can cause severe anxiety and cause the pay the uh, general public to basically freak out and get into an accident you shouldn't drive up right behind somebody and turn on your sirens uh, just to get them out of your way for vehicle control remember the rule about speed go the posted speed limit unless the situation is critical Speed can complicate patient care by providing a rougher ride for those in the back and also decreasing ambulance stability and risk the safety of everyone inside that truck. Sudden braking can also result in loss of control. In older ambulances without anti-lock braking systems, the brakes cut could cause the wheels to lock and the vehicle may skid dangerously. If your vehicle does not have anti-lock braking systems, pump the brakes uh, slowly and smoothly. Newer ambulances typically do have an ABS system in which the brakes should be applied firmly and steadily and not pumped. Also, never brake on in a curve. Uh, when we're coming into a curve, we should be we brake coming in and accelerate coming through and out of the curve. Remember that those driving the vehicles around the ambulance may be distracted by cell phone use, loud music, conversations, eating and drinking, or other things. So just because you're running your lights and sirens does not mean that others are or that other people that other drivers will hear you. So minimize any distractions that you might have. Um, so don't be using your cell phone unless you're using it to use to help navigate. Uh, whoever's riding in the front with the medic that's riding in the front with you or your partner if you, should be the one operating the radios so as long as they're in the front with you. Um, also, driving while fatigued greatly increases the risk of a potential accident. Proper rest and nutrition can decrease this risk. When on duty, you should be physically prepared for any driving situation that may arise. Um, if there is simply, also, if there is simply no way to get around a train, such as using an underpass or overpass within a reasonable distance, wait it out instead of trying inappropriate stunts. Um, be as, also, be alert when approaching a stopped school bus with its red lights flashing. Um, it's not like coming up onto a stop sign or a red light where we can progress through it. We still have to request the right of way from that bus because we don't know who might be coming off of it. So once you come to a stop, uh, you sh the driver, the bus driver will signal you to come through it. For maintaining control at higher speeds, uh, curves can be very dangerous in an ambulance because they are generally top heavy and can roll over easily. Always brake to a desired speed before entering the curve and accelerate on the way out. Always use smooth braking motion and remember that it will take longer for an ambulance to slow down, especially at a higher speed than normal vehicles. So give yourself more room to work. Um, always, always, always use smooth braking motion no matter what because if you just uh, hit that brake hard the person in the back is gonna is going to probably go flying and they're gonna be upset with you it also could potentially harm the patient aggressive drivers also can pose a significant increased risk to you and your vehicle if you notice another vehicle weaving in and out of traffic speeding or otherwise driving in an aggressive erratic manner exercise extreme caution when approaching or passing that vehicle Aggressive drivers are often distracted and may not even notice the presence of an ambulance. Using a police or other emergency vehicle escort is highly dangerous, not only to the escort, but also to the EMT driver, to the patient within the ambulance, and to others on the roadway. All hazards associated with ambulance driving are doubled when an escort is involved because you are the second vehicle through an intersection and motorists usually only expect one emergency vehicle to come through. At intersect collisions, um, usually this occurs when someone's not paying attention. A motorist approaches the intersection just as the light changes. 
Uh, they don't want to sit through the red light, so they sail through the intersection and at the same time that you're coming through and y'all get hit. Uh, if there's two emergency vehicles also, when motorists uh, only expect one, is usually when there's an, an accident occurring. So if you are coming up onto an intersection and there are multiple uh, emergency vehicles responding, first make sure that you maintain a safe distance between your vehicle and the vehicle in front of you. Uh, but follow closely enough so that way the motorist can see both of you in the same glance. Uh, you can also help reduce this by using a different set of, si of sirens. Vehicles waiting at an intersection may also block your view of pedestrians within the crosswalk. Again, slow down and anticipate people in the crosswalk. Uh, usually a, co a common practice that occurs is... Give me one second to draw this out. Do, uh, uh. Alright, there's a uh, blind comedian. Forgive my wonderful drawing skills. Eh, 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 eh. Alright, so we got a four lane, two lane highway, per se. Alright, or right, we're coming up on, a t on an intersection. Alright, you're. Apparatus is down here. Okay. Uh, traffic's going in this type of direction. Doop, doop. And we are at a four way stop. Okay. As you come up to it, as you progress through, there we go. As you progress through the intersection, you should always look in the lane that's coming at you. To ensure that you're before you move into it to ensure that all traffic has stopped. Then once you get up to the next lane, you stop, make sure that it's cleared, move up to the next one, and move up to the next one, move up to the next one, and then proceed on. When driving in rainy or wet ambulances, remember that your vehicle uh, is going to require twice the stopping distance on a wet pavement. And if you're driving on sleet or ice, which yes, we live in South Alabama, but it is still possible for the roadways to freeze over. So you need to even give yourself more distance to ensure that you can stop properly. Uh, make sure that you keep your mirrors clean. Uh, if you're about to go through a large standing puddle, slow down and turn on your wipers before you go through the water. As you leave the water, tap the brakes slightly a few times to dry them out. And if the ambulance starts pulling to one side, pump the brakes slowly and smoothly to dry your brakes out. Uh, if you begin to hydroplane, also make sh hold your wheel steady. Take your foot from the accelerator and gently pump the brake until you re regain control. When driving in the winter, um, you want to make sure that you are carrying equipment appropriate for the weather. Uh, obviously, we generally don't need a lot of cold weather equipment here. But if you work further up north, you might need chains, a shovel, uh, sand or booster cables as well as a towing device. Um, monitor your temperature because um, if the temperature gets down between 28 to 40 degrees and it's raining that rain can quickly turn into freezing rain and even ice. Uh, make sure that your engine is turned on and your heater and defroster are in uh, good working order and your battery is charged to ensure that you're um, that you are always able to get that vehicle going. When driving in fog, mist, dust storms, and smog, make sure that you keep your lights on regardless of the time and day and use your wipers. Uh, if you're driving through any fog or mist or dust storm, don't turn on your high beams because the reflection of the high beams can reduce your ability to see and cause a whiteout. Uh, even if the lights do not improve your ability to see ahead, they can make it possible for other input motorists to see you better with your regular headlights on. If you're traveling uh, 15 miles an hour or more below the speed limit, use your four-way flashers. If you're having to pull off the road and stop because of the inability to see, also make sure that you have your four-ways on as well. <coughs> when driving at night, this is the usually if an accident is going to occur. Uh, this is when it's going to happen because it's even harder for you to see. Make sure that your ambulance ha headlights are in good working order. 
so that way they can ensure that you're providing light on the roadway. Um, keep them clean, properly aimed, and make sure that you check them each day before your shift begins. If you have any burnt out bulbs, they need to be uh, replaced immediately. If you see another driver coming at you with their high beams on, uh, don't flick your high beams at them because uh, ultimately it's going to blind them. Two wrongs don't make a right. Make sure that you keep your windshield clean both inside and out. Keep your eyes moving because if you keep them focused in on one thing, um, you start getting that tunnel vision and you start missing everything else. Also, if you, by keeping your eyes moving, it helps you stay awake as well. <coughs> if you are working a night shift, uh, make sure that you are well rested before you begin your shift. Uh, particularly between 11 and p.m. and 3 a.m. This is the most likely time for intoxicated or drowsy drivers. If you start noticing erratic speeds or people weaving across lines or delayed starts at intersections, use extreme care when passing these people. When using warning devices, always take the increased risk of warning device usage into consideration and weigh it against the benefit of saving a few minutes in transit time. Most agencies and many counties and states have specific protocols for use of these devices. Remember, they are only a means of requesting the right of way from others on the roadway and do not give you any special right or guarantee to clear traffic. The standard color of an ambulance is white, however, and the markings are an orange stripe running around the body, blue lettering, and the Star of Life symbol. It's recommended that any added lettering be kept below the orange stripe so as not to distract from the basic markings. For maximum effectiveness, these standard colors and markings should not be duplicated on vehicles that are not ambulances. Now they come in many facets and fashion, um, and this is used to identify that the vehicle is an ambulance and that it's specific to a specific area. And they even have markings on them to ensure to maximize visibility within traffic, such as the reflective striping on the back of this ambulance. When running emergency calls, you should ensure that your emergency lights are operating. Even in daylight, you should have your headlights on. Um, lights are placed at strategic points on the ambulance to ensure maximum visibility. <coughs> and the reason we don't use red and blue lights is A, that's for police. But white lights are also more visible because it penetrates through light a lot, definitely at night, than, the, than they do with red. Um, when parked or when driving through, through the fog, you should minimize the lights you, that are used. So if you pay attention when you're in, the, in an ambulance, you'll notice that on the rocker switch for the emergency lights, there's a primary and secondary option. When driving in fog or when parked, you should flip it down to the secondary and it's only lighting up the uh, red strobe lights and the white lights are then turned off. When using a siren, you want to make sure that using it uh, carefully. And keep in mind that vehicles may not hear you. Uh, when you're driving, um, the siren only goes about three to four car lengths ahead of you. Um, it's as about as far as it'll go while you're actually driving. Um, and if you're on the highway, the sirens are almost useless because by the time that it reaches its max distance, you're there. <clears throat> Keep in mind also that the sirens are very stressful for patients because um, they use they you know people think oh they're running sirens there must be something really wrong with me. Um, it also prevents others hearing other uh, prevents people from hearing other emergency vehicles. That's why I said earlier, if you are following behind somebody and they are, and it's another emergency vehicle, use a, another tone. That's why usually ambulances and fire engines they are equipped with two, with about three to four different tone settings. You can also consider using your air horn as a need to help clear traffic quickly. 
Uh, however, do not use this horn when close to other vehicles because it can cause auditory injuries to the per people beside you. When working on the roadway, this is quite possibly the highest ch risks or highest chance of somebody getting hurt when working on uh, when working on the scene of an accident. The reason being it's um, a, what do a lot of drivers like to do when they drive past an accident. They like to look and see what's going on. They start rubbernecking. Um, so this causes them to become distracted or people that haven't been driving for very long, they start coming up onto a motor vehicle accident um, and they start wigging out and they get they run into somebody or because of all the lights going on they are unable to see and they get into another accident so we want to make sure that we're able to set up a safe environment for not for us to work in so that way we get out of there safely this is why for one we're required to wear a high visibility public safety vest uh, this helps increase visibility of personnel on the roadway and reduce the incidence of roadway hazards the newer standard that has been created made significant changes to standard class garments to accommodate the public safety responder. This vest has the same retroreflective material as a class 2 vest and nearly the same amount of fluorescent material. The public safety vest includes breakaway features, specific vest dimensions to allow for fit over firefighting turnout gear, and color specific markings to allow for differentiation between law enforcement, fire, and EMS personnel. When working on the scene of a on the side of the roadway, uh, never ever turn your back on traffic. Always be in a position to where you can see traffic coming towards you, um, and do not trust approaching traffic. Not everybody's going to move over, so always keep an eye out for what's going on. Uh, if you're the first arriving uh, vehicle, use your apparatus to cause uh, to create a barrier between the traffic, oncoming traffic, as well as the scene. Um, it's best always to use the biggest apparatus. So if a fire engine is pulling up at the same time as you, let that engine be the barrier. Make sure that you have your, uh, your vest on and any PPE. And at night, turn off any vision impairing lights. So like I said earlier, those, uh, that rocker switch, turn it down to your secondary and it reduces the amount of lights that could potentially impair the vision. Um, use traffic cones to help divert traffic or assign someone to keep an eye on it and help divert traffic out of the way. If you're on working on a hazmat scene, you want to park your vehicles both uphill and upwind so that way, A, you don't have to worry about the wind possibly blowing fumes up into your position as well as if there's a fluid leak it draining down into where you're at now the key to response readiness is ensuring that you have a properly maintained and equipped ambulance always having a vehicle ready to respond in, in all conditions and equipped with all necessary supplies can ensure that you can reach care for and transport your patients and this begins at the beginning of your shift. When you are going through, you're uh, inspecting your truck, you're inventorying everything, making sure that it, your fluid's good, your tires are good, your lights are all in good working order, your truck's clean, you've got uh, your equipment that you need on there, um, make sure that the fuel is fully fueled up, and then you get dispatched. You're dispatched to 123 Sunset Boulevard. Okay, now we're in that phase. We call in route to the scene. We arrive on scene. We begin patient care. Um, we're still ensuring that the scene is safe. We're still good to go. Then we get in route. Receive. Uh, we arrive at the receiving facility, and then we get back to the station. Then we handle our post run. Before each run, same thing as when you at the beginning of each shift, you should be going through and ensuring that everything is good. Uh, obviously, we're not going to go through and check oil uh, after every single run and fluids, but at the beginning of the shift, you should be checking that. Checking the fluid, checking the your wheels to make sure that they're still looking good. Uh, and knowing, you also should know what your services policies are 
if there's any issues that you find with your apparatus that needs to be fixed. You should also always ensure that your vehicle is your uh, is always ready to respond, no matter the conditions that you might come across. Uh, ensure that you ha also have are equipped with all necessary supplies to ensure that you can reach, care for, and transport your patient. Your truck should be inspected daily. Most uh, EMS systems have a checklist of the items to be checked. Your service should have a clear protocol for reporting any problems, taking them out of service if they are deemed unsafe, and performing regular service and maintenance. Legally, you may be within your rights to refuse to use a vehicle uh, that you have reason to believe is unsafe. And incidentally, you might be legal li legally liable for damage caused by a malfunctioning ambulance if you are aware of the problem. Four two two goes over uh, ambulance supplies that you might see on it. We carry supplies and equipment for handling all medical emergencies, injuries, extrications, and even childbirth. This should be checked each day and restocked, cleaned, or maintained as necessary. The next phase of the call is the dispatch. Your dispatcher should provide you with the following information, such as the location of the call, nature of the call, uh, the location and callback number of the caller if needed, um, number of patients as well as location of the patient, such as you're coming up to a uh, park, they'll say they're at Ballfield 1, um, and any other special problems or circumstances that are pertinent that they may be aware of. While en route to the scene, first thing is check all the exterior compartments, make sure that they're closed. Big one, make sure that all exterior compartments are closed and good to go and everything is secured. Once you get into your truck, fasten your seatbelt, verify the information that was provided by dispatch, um, Get and drive responsibly to the scene. Um, go ahead and start thinking what you might need as you're arriving. For example, I get dispatched to a, a 45 year old male difficulty breathing well based on that I'll know I need my stretcher my jump bag my monitor oxygen um, and my drugs potentially and if needed if you're not on an ALS unit you might want to go ahead and consider requesting ALS if necessary once you arrive on scene you go start going through your assessment starting off with scene safety Pay attention to any potential downed electrical lines, leaking fuels or fluids from accident vehicles, smoke or fire, broken glass, trapped or ejected patients, um, and any other indicators of increased risk to you, your crew, or your patients. If other emergency vehicles are on scene or are positioned to block the scene, park in front of or behind a collision, but never alongside it. If no other vehicles are on scene, position your ambulance to provide a safety zone. On a narrow, no park road, Take up the entire roadway so that way no one will try to squeeze past you. Park in a driveway or on the shoulder of the road whenever possible. Stay a minimum of 100 feet from a wreck or burning vehicle and 2,000 feet from a hazmat spill, ideally uphill and upwind. Come to a complete stop, set your parking brake prior to placing the transmission into the parked position. So as you can see, uh, you've found that PD has secured the scene or is controlling traffic. So you're just going to pull up 100 feet ahead. Okay. If you are first on scene, you're just going to park 100 feet behind. This way, that gives you that safety barrier. And then you want to use your, well, in conjunction with lights, put safety cones out to help divert traffic. Coming up on a hazmat, same thing, park your 2,000 feet uh, uphill and upwind from the accident. While at scene uh, for motor vehicle crashes, carefully gain access to the patient or patients and extricate them safely. 
depending you are properly trained for it. Uh, take the time needed to properly splint and immobilize any injured extremities before you move the patient unless they are unstable and determined to be a high priority for patient care. Carefully remove the patient from any wreckage and move them to your ambulance, choosing methods of moving the patient based on their illness or injury. Then transfer your patient to the waiting ambulance, keeping them warm and watching for any changes in their condition. Make sure, also make sure that the patient is securely strapped on the wheeled stretcher with SMR precautions performed as necessary. Once you've moved your patient to the ambulance, you're still providing patient care, but now we are now, we are now in route to the receiving facility. Uh, whoever is uh, driving the vehicle should quickly check the unit, making sure that the outside compartment doors are still closed and secured. Uh, all personnel should be properly seated and secured with safety belts. The only time the, per the uh, attendant in the back should not have a seat belt on is if they are actively providing patient care. Um, based off your assessment, you will determine the necessity of running lights and sirens to, for the transport. You'll continue your treatment and reassessment of the patient. Uh, whoever is uh, driving the ambulance will notify dispatch that you're en route. Um, you will, whoever is the attendant is in the back of the truck will also notify the receiving facility um, as soon as the conditions permit you to call in a report. Once you arrive at the receiving facility, um, you'll make sure that you have all official transfer of care um, to an appropriate health care provider at the receiving facility. As you make your transfer of care, continue to concentrate your care on the patient, paying particular attention to any equipment that the patient requires in that continuum of care. If the receiving facility is crowded, continue your care for the patient until you can officially transfer your patient care responsibility to qualified personnel. Um, move your patient. You'll then move your patient over to the receiving facility's bed. Um, give them your bedside report. Um, your partner will take the stretcher, um, swap linen out. You'll acquire any equipment that may be left with the patient, such as um, pulse ox, vent, blood pressure, cuff, anything along those lines. Um, complete your PCR. Um, while at the hospital, you'll also clean and inspect your ambulance, um, ensure that all your care, your patient care equipment um, is cleaned also, um, any reusable supplies, um, and the compartment itself is clean and ready before notifying dispatch that you are now available for another call. During busy shifts, this can be difficult. Um, there are times where you, as soon as you drop off a patient, you're getting paged out for another one, so you're gonna have to. Qu you may have to quickly uh, do clean up, the, clean out your truck. Uh, if you have any contaminated linen, make sure that you dispose of it appropriately per your agency's biohazard disposal procedures. Um, after some calls, if you require extensive cleaning, disinfecting, and restocking, it may be necessary to go out of service and return to the station to clean and restock your ambulance. If needed, you also need to go by the fuel pumps and refuel your truck. After the call, um, any reports that still needs to be filled out, you need to finish and uh, file. <coughs> if your uniform got soiled with blood, vomit, feces, anything like that, you need to make sure that you change your uniform. And any equipment that needs to be replaced needs to be replaced while you're back at the station. Uh, any sharps that may have been used, they need to be uh, disposed of properly. If you're cleaning the floors, ambulance seats, and countertops, we may use a low-level disinfectant. Um, make sure that you're using appropriate disinfectant or, or um, depending on what you are using. Air medical transport, we, we use this if we're needing to transport the patient to a distant facility such as I uh, have a burn victim and I need them transported to a burn unit, the nearest burn unit mobile, so I, I need to call them for that transport. Um, if I have a prolonged extrication, um, usually if the extrication is going to take longer than 10 to 15 minutes, it's recommended to call for air transport. 
Um, they may need, you might need special skills or supplies or equipment that's unavailable on a ground ambulance, such as rapid sequence intubation. Um, if that's something that I might need, I would call for an air ambulance to come out and um, sedate and paralyze the patients. That way we can quickly intubate them. Medically, uh, the, we also use them if the patient's having a stroke and it's prolonged transport, um, penetrating injuries that where the patient's unstable, um, chest or abdominal trauma where the patient's going into shock. When calling for an uh, air transport, you want to make sure that you provide your name and your department, as well as a callback number in case they need to get in touch with you. You also need to let them know the exact or the nature of the incident. So whether it's a motor vehicle accident, stroke, chest trauma, so that way they know what equipment they need to bring with them. You also need to give them the exact location of the incident. Um, the more detail that you can give them, the better. Uh, on cell phones today, you can even get GPS locations. Um, and even in the Alabama State Protocol app, if you have it downloaded, give me a second as I'm pulling mine up so I can tell you exactly where it's at. Because you can get the, your GPS location out of it as well. If you go to Tools in it and go to... I know there's a spot in here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not. I'm not tr trying to lie to you. Um. Anyways, we'll deal with that later. Anyways, if you can provide them your GPS location as well, that's even better for them. Give them your radio frequency if you. Are if your radio is set up for that as well as the exact location of the landing zone and any hazards that might be presented with them such as power lines um, power lines trees vehicles so on and so forth you also keep want to keep in mind that there's some considerations for transport as well such as weather and environmental limitations they may not be able to fly in or they're not able to fly in severe weather and if depending on the wind um, the cost of it it is very expensive for an air transport um, so we that's why we don't call air transport for just every single thing we also want to have the patient prepared uh, for air transport prior to getting them so because it's very tight quarters it's my, it's a small cabin so they're not able to get up and move around. So if you're needing to intubate, you need to already have them intubated before they arrive. IV lines, medications going, whatever you can get done to prepare that patient for transport. It's the better you can do it, the better the, the outcome. Uh, for when setting up an LZ, you want to make sure that it's clear of any obstructions such as um, rocks, branches, anything that could potentially be picked up. If you're coming up to a scene of a motor vehicle accident, you want to have it set up 150 feet away. Um, also, the LZ itself during the day should be a 60 by 60 square, or at night 100 by 100. If you're having them having to have them land on the highway, you need to have PD on scene to tr stop traffic in all in both ways. Um, also, consider the wind direction because they'll generally fly in with the wind, and they need to be able to fly out. Uh, so you want to make sure that you, there's not trees right up on the um, on the trees in the directions that they would be taken off. Excuse me. You want to make sure that the LZ is properly marked as well. Do not use um, flares because that they could be picked up and cause issues um, by the helicopter coming in. So if you can use emergency vehicles or strobe lights, something along those lines, that would be that would work very well. Uh, when approaching a, a helicopter, remember that the blades can potentially dip down as low as four feet above the ground. So when approaching, cr uh, crouch when approaching, and only approach once th when the pilot says you can come in. Uh, never approach from behind the pilot because then they cannot see you. And the tail rotor is spinning very quickly. 
<coughs> where sometimes you may not even be able to see it and the pilot may have to move the tail boom without warning so if he doesn't know you're back there he may have to move turn the tail boom and he in turn uh, hits you in the process if you need to go from one side of the craft to the other uh, always cross in front of the craft never behind or underneath if the helicopter had to land on a hillside or on an incline always approach from the downhill side never from the uphill side uh, there's some recommended guidelines that we have taken to reduce the potential of theft or attacks on us um, if there's any security issues that need to be brought up that, that'll be uh, discussed at the beginning of each shift um, or if you're going to a special event any security issues will be brought up then your vehicles our vehicles should be checked at all times um, whether it is a tracking device that is installed um, or they may have a cell phone or something that is being able to be able to be tracked also um, our vehicles should never be left running or unintended with the keys in the vehicle while unlocked. Um, there are some that uh, may have a say, a special feature where you can unlock it from the outside. But if you're going inside of somewhere or like for example inside the hospital or inside of a patient's house, you should take the keys out before going in. Uh, you should always ensure that security measures are strongly enforced when the vehicle is off the EMS premises for repairs or other work conducted by repair or installation facilities. These should include securing the vehicle indoors overnight when the facility is not open, not leaving the keys in the vehicle or in a place where there is easy access, and not allowing the vehicle to leave the premises for any unauthorized travel while being repaired. Um, also reporting any unusual interest by an individual related to an EMS vehicle. If you are, if your vehicle is going out of service or going into the shop, any equipment that needs to be come off should be removed, and all warning devices and markings should be removed from the vehicle um, if it is being sold. The EMS agency should provide identification credentials to anyone who is to purchase uh, EMS uniforms or identification items. This check should be made against a database of authorized purchasers of these types of items. This to ensure that uh, Joe Schmo can't walk into the uniform store and buy the uniform of an, e of an EMS company um, and then turn around and take advantage of it. Keep in mind that carbon monoxide is emitted from the ambulances, so you want to make sure that you are uh, aware of that. Um, it does could potentially come from the vehicle's exhaust. You should never use any gasoline or fuel-based equipment in the back of an ambulance. Um, also, you should make sure that your windows are properly are secured, um, so that way any vehicles that are parked next to you or traveling by the ambulance doesn't get pulled in. To prevent potential poisoning from carbon monoxide, you should make sure that your engine is properly tuned up and inspected, keeping the rear windows shut so that way the exhaust fumes from the back of the truck doesn't uh, float in. Uh, don't use your exhaust fans or any static fans, and always make sure that you keep the heater or AC on to circulate the air. Alright guys, that concludes this chapter. If you have any questions, please be sure to send me a message. Make sure that you are knocking at your Brady Labs. Um, other than that, I will see you all next time.